day you're gonna wake up and just be like, I have so many issues. <laughs> oh no, I mean, you know, part of blocking them out is like you deal with them in your own little way, and then you let it go. Yeah. And now, are you still blocking stuff out? Like, yeah, I'm tired. Yeah, I'm tired. Yeah, I'm, tired. Yeah, I'm, tired. I'm stuck in reality. Yeah. That was me. Portobello mushroom sandwich with uh, provolone and Jackie kisses both of you guys who ate. I got it. Taste it. really good, man. Where'd you get it from? Um, my finance trading client that does like finance fair trade. Mm. I gotta get a client that gives me dark chocolate. Yeah, dude. I had a whole box of it before the class. Have you heard of the gaming clients? Like a lot of the finance? They freaking rock, dude. Like, they'll have like a party like twice a year and it'll involve being over at someone's house, like really good food, busting out guitars, singing songs in Spanish and looking at Nicaragua.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. I'm David Elwood, Dean of the Kennedy School. And uh, this is a bittersweet uh, night for me tonight because this is my last chance to introduce in his current role, uh, Michael Ignatieff, who is uh, a professor here at the Kennedy School, but is leaving us to do, uh, to run for office in Canada. If ever there was someone who basically characterizes the, or epitomizes what we as a school would like to represent, it seems like it's Michael Ignatieff, because he brings to the table a combination of extraordinary passion, compassion, and a deep moral compass. But he combines that with a great intellect, a focus on the practical, and a desire to ultimately move things forward. It is a marvelous combination, and again, I think it is what we at the Kennedy School must aspire to. So I, first of all, just hang in for my <laughs> It probably should come as no surprise uh, if you've seen his biography that Michael is this remarkable man. After all, not that many people you know have won major prizes for both fiction and nonfiction, and Michael has done both. He is the director of the Carr Center and has served as director since uh, 2000 of uh, the Carr Center for Human Rights. And he has made this center into one of the premier organizations in the world. It's really one of the most, perhaps the most influential academically oriented uh, institution on human rights. And as a professor, he, is been, he has been deeply committed to the students, uh, to this institution, and to a larger set of issues. And so again, he brings a great deal to the table. Now, beyond all his many accomplishments, of course, um, Michael has, uh, and I'm, uh, you're welcome to read his biography elsewhere, he has some other very important qualities. Uh, he certainly has been a radio and television uh, commentator, uh, both in Canada and the United States. He's, as I mentioned, ri written a lot of books. He frequently writes long and very thoughtful articles in, playing in the New York Times Magazine. But probably far more important is he's a very good bowler. And as those of you know, that bowling figures prominently in social capital. And uh, so we are very, very proud that Michael will be going on to build social capital, uh, uh, not only the way he's built it here, but hopefully within the larger Canadian context, um, Bob Putnam will be very, very proud. So with that, let me, uh, let's begin our conversation. And I have to admit, I have never done a kind of interview session like this with a member of my faculty. Uh, I haven't done that many of them anyway, so David Gergen, where are you? Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll do what we can. But let me start by noting the, the, uh, the title of this forum, which is uh, Human Rights Where the Action Is. So is it where the action is? <laughs> Well, first of all, just let me say um, uh, I'm being done a great honor. It's a great honor to be interviewed by David and to be in front of people I'm so fond of. And I'm having so much trouble leaving. To the question, um, where is the action? First, where, is the, where isn't the action? The thing that uh, some of you may have uh, come to a session with Louise Arbour, last Thursday. She's the Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN. One of the things that she said, I think, is, tells you where the action isn't. The UN system wrote all the international human rights treaties and conventions, and it did a great job doing that. And that phase is now finished. We probably need an anti-terror convention, and we, I think, desperately need an international convention on migration to regulate migration. But in a curious way, the action is not at the UN anymore. Uh, the thing that's so interesting about the human rights field to me now is that if you ask where the action is, it's in the NGO community. It's at the WTO. It's Oxfam leading four West African countries to challenge US cotton subsidies. Um, it's um, campaigners in South Africa working to get neverapine and other HIV AIDS reducing drugs 
uh, offered as a matter of right in South Africa. Um, human rights has gone global by going local, and the action is tremendously driven by NGOs, and it's moving into the economic and social rights field in a way that you couldn't have conceived uh, 25 years ago. And then finally, the other thing that is a matter of astonishment is that over the last 25 years, human rights has become central to the foreign policy envelope or agenda of almost every state in ways that, again, 25 years ago you wouldn't. But the future of human rights, it seems to me, is in economic and social rights and in this debate between the northern and southern developing and developed worlds over the duties that rich countries have towards poor countries and the rights that poor people in poor, in poor countries can claim of, of resources in the rich. That seems to me where it's going. It's interesting. I mean, you raised in passing the idea of migration as an issue for the future. Say more about what those, where that's likely to be headed, because it seems to me that, <clears throat> that maybe the next big globalization is about movement of people, not just economic resources. And if that's true, that's going to create, we've seen it in France, um, we see it around the world, that's surely going to open up a whole range of issues. Yeah. I think migration is, is among the most internationally lawless areas. That is, migration policy is regulated state by state by state, and everybody kind of does it differently. And you notice in the European Union, for example, that the last power that states are unwilling to surrender, I mean, the United Kingdom, for example, is control over migration policy. And we have an international refugee convention, which provides rights of asylum and rights of non-refoulement, that is, you can't be sent back, only for people who claim refugee status. But there's not much international law governing what's happening on the Rio Grande, right? And there's not much international law regulating what's happening from, you know, um, Morocco into Spain. What's happening is we're building barbed wire. That's what we're doing. Uh, and uh, there's not much international law regulating Haitians struggling ashore um, at, uh, you know, Key Biscayne or wherever it is in Florida. And I, and I do think this is um, the hottest zone, the most troubling zone, the most lawless zone of, of international human rights you know, because it, it goes right up against deep state interests. Uh, everybody, I think, has to acknowledge this, the, the degree to which the United States is, and its economy is invested in, complicit in, illegal, low-wage, sure. undocumented migration. I mean, it just suits everybody down to the ground. Uh, the people who hire undocumented illegals to clean their houses, the people who hire undocumented illegals to make sure that the tomato salsa Taco Bell is going to be cheap. I mean, everybody, we're all dug into this economy. And one of the things that has to change, I think, is a, is a national conversation about whether we really want to be complicit in a low-wage, undocumented economy that is so rights-violative. Um, so it's a it's a, it's a human rights challenge for, for all of us, it seems to me. Yeah. Um, you're particularly identified with um, a very challenging set of questions around how you can use human rights to justify military intervention. For some people, that's almost an anathema. Hmm. Uh, but you've been very, very thoughtful and very, very vocal about that. So to help exp tell me more about that position. Well, I, it is a, you know, Let's understand why it's a problem, first of all. I mean, I think that there's a strong sense in which human rights doctrine appears to be essentially a pacifist doctrine because of the right to life, because of the commitment to the sanctity and importance of human life. It doesn't sit just at a theoretical level with the use of military force. But I think one of the things that happened at the end of the Cold War um, was uh, the onslaught of ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, the onslaught of genocide in uh, Rwanda, uh, unpunished genocide in places like Darfur. And a sense, and then the thing that I saw with my own eyes, the genocidal behavior of Saddam Hussein towards the Kurdish people and the Shia 
in the, in, in from 87 through to 92. And I just think people then thought, particularly if you were in the Balkans as I was, and Samantha Power, my colleague, was there too, and lots of people were there, you just sat there and watched people being killed and tormented and driven from their homes for no other reason than that they had this ethnicity or this religion or this faith. And you thought, I mean, you just, you had very simple thoughts about that. You thought something has to be done. The only thing I can think of doing is get some soldiers in here to push them apart. And then when that doesn't work, get soldiers to, or get military assistance to, to beat the ethnic cleansers. So a lot of it, you know, I'd like to claim it was all highly theoretical and worked out, but a lot of it was just catching up with history, you know, being there as bad things happen and feeling slowly that, that we had to have a doctrine of intervention that could simply protect human beings. And then as we went forward in the 1990s after Kosovo, I think there was a pause and everybody thought, well, we've backed ourselves into a new doctrine of intervention. What is this doctrine? And then I was part of an international commission on sovereignty and intervention that tried to write the rules for it which were that you know, if there's actual or apprehended genocide or ethnic cleansing, states have a duty to protect either, first their own populations and then other populations when other states won't protect them. And so that responsibility to protect doctrine, I think, began to kind of capture what was trying to be said during the 90s. And then came Iraq, which is another kettle of fish. I want to come back to that in a moment, but I... I do, the problem is that so often these things occur in situations where you have a failed state. And so you come in and you impose order of some sort, perhaps at great cost. How do you, how do you end up not becoming like Iraq, the state that, you know, it's a quagmire. You're stuck there forever and yeah. you become the issue. Yeah. You're the one thing everyone can agree on. They don't like you. Well, just stick again to the failed state piece. I mean, I think that's another thing that happened when we uh, came out of the Cold War. First, a new explosion of self-determination struggles, which created 14 new states. Yugoslavia was the center of wars of self-determination in the 90s. And there were self-determination struggles in the Baltic and then in the uh, the uh, Caucasus and in the Asian republics of the Soviet Empire. Um, one of the third or maybe fourth periods of nation creation, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century. The problem has been, and I think this is a challenge we're waking up to very slowly, is that human populations get self-determination in the worst possible circumstances. They have a terrible colonial legacy. I mean, the Soviets are awful or the British are awful, or the Belgians are awful, but the colonial legacy is terrible. So they get freedom and they've got two miles of roads and no schools and no, you know, just awful. So they get freedom and they've got no infrastructure to manage or use freedom or serve their own people with freedom. And then they get kleptocratic elites who use tribal and ethnic uh, linkages to create and hold power and then capture the state and use the state to extort, extort resources for their own tribal or ethnic or religious group to the exclusion of everybody else. And that then causes the state to collapse completely. And then you've got no one that you can give aid to because it's all going to be stolen. And so there are millions, hundreds of millions of human beings whose chief problem in the world is that they live in rapacious, kleptocratic, and essentially failed institutional orders. And, you know, for my money, that's one of the most serious human rights crises of the modern world. And Congo would be kind of ground zero for that problem. But there are lots of other places where it's also the case. And then to get to the quagmire point, what do you do about Congo? And only a fool would say they knew. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a nightmare. And it's a nightmare because of the Belgians. And it's a nightmare because other African states have just seized on the Congo and tried to rip off its you know, right. various diamonds and this and that. Uh, the roads run out of Kinshasa. Uh, everybody's on the take. 
and the wonderful people of Congo, and we've had Congolese students at the Kennedy School, and they're fantastic people. It's just almost impossible to see how you get the traction to recreate state order. But if that's the single most important human rights challenge I see you know, going forward. Well, so, I mean, shouldn't we be thinking about how we create what comes after military invention far more than we're thinking about the intervention themselves? Do we have ways to really have the end game straight? Um, because walking in and walking out is clearly not going to work very well. Yeah. Well, the Iraq story, and I don't want to duck the Iraq story. Everybody knows that I supported it because I'd been to northern Iraq in 1992, and I'd seen what Saddam had done to the Kurds and the Shia, and I just, you know, I just thought, you know. Tell this, us more about your sort of this, your history with Iraq and also where well, it's led you down. I mean. The thing I am led to reflect upon as a public policy matter is how much weight to accord searing personal experience in your life. This was the most, one of the most searing personal experiences of my life going to northern Iraq uh, in the liberated Kurdish zones and seeing what the Kurds had been put through. And I just came out of it thinking one very simple thought, this guy has got to go. It just, this is just off the dial. And when people say there are a lot of bad guys in the world, I, I had to say he was in my top one or two or three, right? Now, then the question is, as a, because you're public policy students, how much weight to accord searing moral experience? Because they're competing priorities. Namely, do you want an international order in which one superpower blunders around putting the worlds to rights without UN Security Council approval? That's a competing priority to your moral priority of something must be done. So did I balance that? That's a question I do ask myself. Um, in the decision to go to war, there was a third factor, which was clearly he's a human rights monster, but is he a threat to international peace and security? You know, the Burmese regime's an awful regime, but it's not an obvious threat to international peace and security. The question was whether Saddam was. He had been, invasion of Iraq, invasion of Iran, pretty bad charge sheet, but the factual question that the world had to decide is, did he have weapons, weapons program, weapons capability, and strategic intention? There was no question he had strategic intention. That guy wanted nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons if he could get them. He had some programs, experimental programs. He deployed resources to that, and because the sanctions regime was leaking, he was getting a lot of revenue that he could put to nefarious purposes. As a factual matter, however, he did not have weapons capability that constituted a threat to international peace and security. So I was simply wrong about that, along with several other world leaders that we could name. Um, <clears throat> but it's an important thing, because it's important to understand that I don't think you can make a case for coercive military intervention unless you've got a threat to international peace and security and a human rights trigger as well. And the two had to be together, and we had one but not the second in my, in my judgment. So, you know, that's how I look back on, it, uh, back on it now. But your previous question, though, was about something that I think Iraq also reveals very painfully. If you are going to intervene, you have to clear the jus ad bellum case, you know, you've got to have just cause and right intention and all that stuff that the Catholic Church Fathers said going in. Then you have to have jus in bello, that is you have to conduct the operation in a manner that is consistent with the Geneva Conventions. And then, and this is Michael Walzer's contribution, you have to have a jus post bellum, meaning if you take over the place, you have obligations of justice to do an intervention in such a way that you don't make the place worse than when you went in, right? Now, jus ad bellum wasn't so terrific. Jus in bello, actually, because the US military is pretty Geneva Conventions compliant in operation, wasn't so bad, but jus post bellum was a catastrophe of, of astounding proportions. And I say astounding because, poor fool me, we, one of the things I'm proudest of at the Car Center is we spent a lot of time talking to the US military about Geneva Conventions compliance and 
human rights compliance, and we have very good and high-level connections. And all of these people, poor fools in the US military, were planning like crazy for the post, the phase four, the post-bellum phase. And basically, the, the administration thought they would rather have um, ideological fantasy than post-invasion planning. And by ideological fantasy, I mean they thought we'd be out in 90 days and people would be sticking carnations in our gun holes. Well, I mean, that is irresponsible public policy at its worst. That is taking wishes for facts. And it's a terribly painful lesson. It was always going to be difficult. But, you know, just to capture this so the people recover their fury about this. There's a moment in the Woodward book which seems to me the worst public, moment of public policy failure in my adult life when Tommy Franks goes to Crawford, Texas in January 2002. Note the date, that is right after the Afghanistan operation. He presents 134 slides of the entire phase one, phase two, and phase three of the military operation to take Iraq. The entire leadership of the United States is either in the room or on video conference. And there isn't a single military figure, there isn't a single civilian figure, there isn't a single elected official who asks this question, where is phase four? There isn't one person who asks that question, right? Now, you just can't do public policy where lives are at stake if you don't ask, what do we do when we break the China? I mean, you just can't do it. And, and the Iraqi people have paid a horrendous price. 25, 30,000 people have died who probably needn't have died because we didn't think this thing through. And, you know, this is a, a tragic story. And, it, and the consequences, the con let's spill out the consequence. The consequence is that mili military intervention for good causes is going to be that much difficult, more difficult everywhere else. Why is it so impossible to get anything going on Darfur? Because we screwed up Iraq. So the follow-through consequences of this failure are extremely serious. Well, it's, you know, Colin Powell has been he talked about, you know, lies, if you break it, you own it, and so forth. That just wasn't part of the conversation ever. Not as far as I can see, because I think people were sold a bill of goods partly by Iraqi exiles, so it's wrong to blame the messenger. I mean, the, Certainly the, many people were talking about this. Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to duck off the hook myself. I think I didn't understand how difficult Iraq would be. Uh, I knew it, I'd been there. I'd been there since uh, the, the invasion. Uh, I didn't understand some of the tensions that were pulling Iraq apart, some of the because the real core of the problem is that if you've been ruled by terror for 40 years, it pulverizes, it atomizes society. You haven't got the trust to do public business. You haven't got the trust to do democratic politics. The one thing I would say, and I feel you know, tremendously strongly about that, is if you've ever been to Iraq, as I've been now only twice, and some of you have perhaps been yourself, you meet Iraqi Democrats. You meet people who know what a decent society is. You meet people who want to have government by the people, and for the people, and of the people. They know this stuff, right? They're often good Muslims. They're often believers of that great faith. They want to hold the country together. They want to use oil for the benefit of all the people. And, and they're putting on flak jackets to do democratic politics. You know, and I don't have much faith in, in the American administration anymore, but I have continuing faith in those people's courage. And, I, you know, whatever we decide to do about Iraq, and there are limits to what the American public can stand in terms of casualties and investment, it would be a tragedy if we abandoned those courageous people, because they are there, and with a little help, they might get us to, them to, a, a, a decent democratic Iraq. Well, now you too are becoming a Democrat with a small d, <clears throat> or a liberal with a papal L. Um, and uh, you were just, uh, Michael told me this morning, you were out at 6.30 in the morning at a subway stop in 15 below weather. You weren't wearing a flak jacket, but you must have been wearing a lot. Um, what on earth would lead you to this, uh, this chance to, uh, to run for office in 15 below weather? 
Well, well, sometimes I do wonder, A, because of the 15 below zero, but for, for other kind of things, running for political office makes you appallingly self-conscious. Let me give you a very direct example. I should be sitting up. I should not be slouching. <laughs> and I should not be grimacing. I should not be looking skywards. And I should be looking you firmly in the eye. I've been very concerned. And my answer should be much more concise. <laughs> the entire discussion we have had is I went to media training on Sunday. I, this event Didn't would take. give me a failing grade. <laughs> but I'm among friends and to hell with it. This may be the last time when I can just be the way I actually am. Anyway, so that's the first thing. There are a lot of problems. Um, why did I do it? Uh, there's a long answer, but the short answer that's relevant to this audience is the Kennedy School of Government. No, we, I've spent five years teaching public policy. And a year ago, someone came to me and said, would you do elected public service? And you can't get up every morning of every day of every week you're in the Kennedy School and urge other young, young people to do public service. And when they ask you, you say, I'll take a pass. You just, you got to do it, seems to me. I mean, there are a ton of other reasons, but being in this school, changed my life and changed the way I think about these issues. Well, that seems like a marvelous uh, note to turn to the questions on. <laughs> so there are microphones, as always, located here, 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 and here. <clears throat> and let me remind you of the usual ground rules. Number one, a good question involves you're identifying yourself. Number two, it involves one, and especially this form, one question, and it's short. Um, and number three, uh, it should end with a question mark. So uh, let's start right over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Carberry. I'm a student here. And from what you said, I'm inferring that the threshold you would set for intervention is, again, human rights abuses and a threat to security outside yep. that state. So how do you deal with the Zimbabwe's and the Burmas of the world, and what should the international community do in those cases? Yeah. That's a great question and a difficult one. Let me slide by Zimbabwe and Burma for a second, not because I want to duck it, but, but to take the case of Rwanda. Because the case in Rwanda was, at the time, it's a bad human rights abuse when it started, but there's no case of a threat to international peace and security. Ten years on, what we understand is that Rwanda was a catastrophe for the state order of the entire Great Lakes re region. So the point I'd make is that there was a human rights catastrophe, which we saw. What we didn't see, and should have seen at the time, is that failure to intervene would set out a cascade of destabilization through the whole region. I'd make the same analogous case with Zimbabwe. But it seems to me Zimbabwe is a human rights disaster. You know, the, the mass demolition of poor people's homes is, is just awful. The destruction of economy is awful. The, the passage from a, a, a place that was the breadbasket of southern Africa and a, and a dynamo for southern Africa into a place that's basically kept alive by the World Food Program is a, is a catastrophe for that whole region but it's also having destabilizing effects on the whole state and economic order. Now, I simply don't understand why South Africa isn't, under, isn't taking proactive steps to, to just appreciate the threat to its own security from the, the unfolding catastrophe in Zimbabwe. So what's the net from that? We have to think of threats to international peace and security in a larger way, not necessarily threats to our you know, northern security, but threats to the state order in the region around which these states are located. In the Zimbabwean case, I, I simply don't see how, why it is that Thabo and Becky three or four years ago said, we have a very nice villa for you. We want you to go into dignified retirement, but you're destroying our country and you're betraying everything that the African liberation movement fought for for 40 years. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I get it. That is, I know that there's all this stuff about not wanting to take lessons from white people and colonial oppressors,
but I don't respect that intellectually or morally. It's been, his inaction has been devastating for Zimbabwe, and it's devastating for, for, um, for, uh, uh, for South Africa. As for Burma, we have very bad instruments for getting compliance from bad regimes. The worst instrument is sanctions. We, when, we, when we surround countries and try to put pressure on them, we end up hurting the people. So one of the difficulties I have about crafting intervention strategies is not wanting to have what could be called collateral human rights damage. So I haven't got a smart answer about Burma at all. Right up here. Uh, hi, Professor Tim Reed. Uh, I do know each other. Um, I wonder, could you just comment, coming from your years at the Kennedy School and perhaps your future career, what responsibility, given the fact that um, many of these uh, regimes, that, which are so nasty, receive substantial foreign aid, which they put to bad use, what is the responsibility of the donor countries in all this? Uh, how should we hold them to account? Hmm. Well, I, I think we are beginning to apply governance conditionality assessment to all foreign aid. That is, we're beginning to understand that aid can make the human rights situation and the governance situations of many of these states worse. I mean, I find it inconceivable, for example, that you would loan, this is my favorite example, that you would loan a dime to a regime like Angola, which spends more on medevac for its elite than it does for the entire primary health care budget of Angola. You know, that kind of thing. That is to say, um, and domestically, I'm actually rather sympathetic to the increasing problem that we have in sustaining domestic support in our national electorates for foreign aid, because we have a sense that we're giving it to some bad people. And all I can think of doing, and that's something that the Carr Center has been involved in, is improving the degree to which we measure human rights performance and governance performance and corruption performance. This is one of the revolutions in human rights practice that has been least noticed but is most important, which is we're getting much better metrics that allow us to target and focus aid on those who are relatively uncorrupt, relatively rights observant, and relatively on a development path that anybody can see makes sense. So my sense of this is that we got to measure and we got to be tougher and we got to be much more selective and pull the plug on regimes that have a bad human rights sheet. I can't see anything else to do. Right up here. Um, beyond um, uh, human rights, there is the question of human security. Um, I know that the UNDP since 1994 hasn't been very successful in promoting the concept of human security. I know that Canada has been trying in the last years to revive it. It seems that the human security is human rights plus socioeconomic rights, fundamental rights. So mm -hmm. it could seem like an ideal solution for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your take on this? And more specifically, do you see any space to put human security into international law? Because it is not yet. Mm -hmm. And if it is, where should it be done? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know about the second piece human security inter into international law since I'm, I'm bad at that part of it. I mean, I, I'm also a, an international law skeptic. There are certain Europeans who think you've got, a term, you've got a real result when you've written a convention that puts something into international law language. My sense of that is that's just the beginning. You've got to make this thing have some traction on the ground. The, the thing that human security added to the intellectual debate about this, I think, was to make every, it, it found a way to put into words the simple intuition that you can't have a secure world where people are hungry, angry, frightened, and ill. You can't have, you can't have security between states if human populations are angry, hungry, ill, and ill-educated. That connection, the, the, the sense that there's an integral connection between the security of states and the physical, mental security of individual populations has been a huge conceptual leap. And Canada did play a very creditable role. 
And then the question is to translate that into practical public policy. Um, and that's something the UNDP is doing as well as anybody. Hi, uh, excuse me, uh, Chris Gay in mid-career MPA. Uh, actually, Sean stole my question, so I'll narrow it down to, to North Korea, not to put you on the spot. Um, should, the same, should the logic by which you advocated going into Iraq apply there? You, you have an abusive regime, clearly, and, and one that probably has a greater probability of having weapons of mass, product, um, weapons of mass destruction yeah. than Iraq did. So, I mean, should we be looking to intervene there? Or would you advocate intervening there? Well, not if it means that 300,000 people die in Seoul. I mean, yes, the conditions exist, but what's different is that these people do have nuclear weapons. One of the reasons that drove a lot of people to believe that military action had to be taken against Saddam now is that once he's got this stuff, he can do anything he wants to his people, and he can do anything he wants in the region. So that was the case for preemption. The case for preemption was related to the problem that you can intervene in a place with, like North Korea, because they've got them. And they also have 1.2 million people at arms. They're one of the largest conscription militaries in the world. And these people, I think, I, I don't mean this in a psych, psychodynamic way. I mean it in a geostrategic way. These people are crazy. Right? I mean, they're very, very you, you cannot tell what these people will do, right? So you don't want to bluff them. And I just think that takes military intervention off the table. Um, this, my colleagues at this school gamed out uh, um, a range of strikes at nuclear reactors um, in the 90s and came to conclude that this was simply too dangerous. And from them, I've learned that it's simply too dangerous to use military force in this area. So it's a very disappointing result. And it means that you can't be as consistent as I was like, simply because the, the human cost of intervention there is simply unbearable. And, and it won't be paid by Americans. It'll be paid mostly by South Koreans. The piece of that that I have criticized, and everybody's criticized, is is the in ongoing complicity of the Americans, the international community, and the South Koreans in feeding a starving population. I mean, the thing that I find most monstrous about the North Korean situation is that the international community, faced with a nuclear rogue, has basically propped the regime up for the last decade. And my sense is if there's a policy piece here, and it's risky, I admit it's risky, and it may have some human rights cost, is to start saying, listen, get serious. We, we can't live in a world where rogue states pass the entire cost of maintaining their populations to the international community. It's just, this just doesn't add up. We've got to cut that back, but do it in a way that doesn't starve the North Koreans. Now, how, how, is that a difficult human rights problem? You bet. But that's where I would go. I would look at the food aid, all the bilateral stuff we're doing that keeps this odious regime going. I just think we're, they have taken a nuclear weapon and waived it, and by waiving it, passed the entire cost of maintaining their populations onto the international community. And that bluff, I think, can be called. Right here. Good evening. Uh, using the same criteria you just mentioned, how would you characterize the justification or need for intervention in currently uh, Ahmadinejad uh, ruled Iran, which is believed to be just months away from uh, having uh, weapons of mass destruction? I was in Iran in uh, late June. I was there for seven days, and therefore I'm an expert on it. <laughs> There's nothing about Iran I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think the American position, which is to deny a member state of the United Nations the peaceful use of nuclear power, is just untenable. It seems to me Iran has a legitimate right to have peaceful nuclear energy. The problem is that they are um, probably proceeding to weaponization. Mohammed el Baradai and other states have come up with proposals that uh, 
advocate a multilateral provision of nuclear fuel that would remove from Iran the necessity to develop its own fuel cycle, which could then be weaponized. So I'm, a, I'm a in favor of essentially multilateral engagement with these people. The problem is that this is a regime that is um, practicing what the French call fuit en avant, that is to say, in a, in a kind of politique à l'outrance, for domestic reasons, it seems to me, this guy is engaging in kind of rampant anti-Zionist and borderline anti-Semitic rhetoric. It mobilizes his base. It conceals the fact that domestically the regime is failing its people. He made populist promises during the election which he's not going to be able to deliver to ordinary people in South Tehran. So he saber rattles and does all that stuff as a diversionary tactic. Um, and it's very important that the international community keep him engaged, talk him off his, off, off his, the end of the tree back, backwards, because he's getting, I think, increasing domestic pressure, which he's diverting by international game playing. But I don't, I don't think there's an. I don't think there's an intervention strategy worth a darn militarily, and no military person I've ever looked at uh, thinks there is. Because the other, the, the other point about the international system is the bad guys learn. You can do a Sirach once, you can't do it twice. You know, the, the preemptive strike by Israeli aircraft against the Iraqi nuclear reactor in 1981, that was when bad guys concentrated nuclear programs in one place. Now they disperse it to 150 sites. No American president wants to, wants to you know, play a kind of military lottery with 250 possible sites in Iran hoping to take them out by surgical strikes. It's just not doable. The only game you've got is, is multilateral engagement. And here, this is a difficulty that the United States and this administration has in understanding that sometimes with these people only multilateral engagement with the dreaded French and the wretched Germans and the unreliable British, it's the only game you've got. Because they won't talk to you, but they might talk to Jack Straw or that French foreign minister. And you know the, the Americans have made things much, much tougher by their active contempt for, for their allies and for their friends and the people who have good diplomatic relations with these people. You've got that pablum politician speak down <laughs> just so. <coughs> it's clear you don't say anything. Yeah, no, it's terrific. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Connors. I'm an MPP1. Um, we've talked a little bit about the role of the military in terms of advancing human rights and also about state-to-state -state, um, aid. But I wanted to ask a little bit about the role of business, mm -hmm. um, what it might have, whether engagement is something that, that can um, effectively promote human rights. Mm -hmm. Well, the Center for Business and Government here and John Ruggie have led on that issue. Um, the Global Compact initiated by the UN at uh, Professor Ruggie's leadership has been in the forefront of, 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 of doing that. The, the piece of this that I'm most interested in is a rather small piece of it, which is global energy companies. Um, one of the and, and their human rights responsibilities. One of the reasons, one of the paradoxes of, that you see everywhere is that oil, when you discover oil in a poor country, it tends to produce an unfailing chain of human rights disaster. That is, $300 billion has come ashore from Nigeria since 1968, since getting shell discovered oil in the Delta you know, GDP per capita is stalled in Nigeria. Go to Angola, um, huge, unbelievable deep ocean oil reserves and catastrophic human rights performance at home. Why is that? Why is it that wealth is such a curse and why is it that oil wealth is such a curse? One piece of that, it seems to me, is that uh, oil companies come into these places and do competitive bidding for 
you know, for, for um, uh, development tranches, you know, sites to, to drill for. They do these development pieces, and there is no conditionality attached to that. The conditionality I'm thinking of, say, in the case of, of uh, Angola would be you can bring, you can get a revenue from oil, but the government, when it does a deal with you, must commit to a certain slice of that revenue going to primary health care, primary education. That is, the problem I feel in, the, in this sector is, is we approach the corporate social responsibility piece as if it's simply a piece about your labor conditions and how you employ people and how you do business and how you price your goods. The real problem, I think, is that energy companies get into business with bad governments and reinforce their corruption and reinforce their incapacity. And you want to create new resource arrangements between oil companies and governments, possibly with World Bank and international assistance that just simply says, look, let's have some transparency in how the revenue stream is spent, and let's have some of it going to meet social need. But that's a very different role. I mean, Shell will say, well, why is that our business? To, why, do we, why should we care how they spend the money we give them, right? That's the problem. And I think that's the new frontier here, to create international condominiums for resource development that involve a commitment to the human rights and transparency and governance of the societies in which they work. And that's the place where I think it's the, it's the new frontier of, of this field. Where are we here? I'm Josh Frydenberg. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, we've seen recent murmurings of democracy in Egypt, Lebanon, and the Palestinian territories. Um, to what extent are these a product of our intervention in Iraq? And what prospects are there for real democracy in those countries? places? I doubt that it has much to do with our interventions, to be truthful. I would like, given that I was committed to intervention, to say that it had ripple effects throughout the region. Um, I think that's probably historically very naive. These societies are changing all the time. Uh, these societies have, are experiencing globalization. They're opening up to the world. They have increasing amounts of internet usage. Their middle classes are, tra are training and learning. Many of them are coming places like this to learn. They come back, they look at their societies, and they go, oi, well, let's do better, right? Or whatever they say, right, let's do better. So there are a lot of indigenous drivers of, of democratic discontent throughout the Middle East that have absolutely nothing to do with the United States. But having said that, and again, it's difficult in liberal Cambridge, I think it's been historically important that the President of the United States committed himself in, I think, November 2002 to democracy promotion and human rights as core goals of American foreign policy. I know that nobody believes him. I don't especially believe him either, but these presidential statements are tremendously important because they're full of historical ironies. If you're a human rights person, the speech that President George W. Bush gave at the National Endowment for Democracy is the speech that human rights advocates had been praying a president to make for 40 years. That's the irony, and I don't, I mean, it's politically incorrect in this environment to say so, but that's the irony of the situation. No president has committed himself more forcibly to democracy promotion as an ideal and purpose American foreign policy. Then there's the whole question of whether they do any of it. Then there's the whole question of whether the National Endowment for Democracy actually programs in Egypt in ways that actually have a positive effect. But I do think there has been some seed money, some encouragement to dem democratic forces in the Middle East that can be attributed to change in American policy. Because I think that the, the larger strategic environment here is, is decisive. The President of the United States got the flight manifests from those planes that flew into the Twin Towers on, two, on September 12th, 2001. And the President looked at the fact that there were 16 Saudi nationals and a Yemeni or two. And anybody would have thought, one thought, the entire foreign policy of the United States in the Middle East is now in ruins. 
We have invested 50 years in this damn gas station in Saudi Arabia, and what have we got? We've got the most serious strategic attack on the homeland since Pearl Harbor. Well, if that's what you wake up to on the 12th of September 2001, you have to change your policy. And they did. That's why I believe that when he said, you know, in November 2002, we have spent 60 years backing tyranny in the Middle East and what has it got us? I mean, I think this wasn't rhetoric. I think this was strategic recognition that they had to change their policy. Now, the problem with the policy is, if you go to a place like Egypt, do you want to bet on the Muslim Brotherhood? The problem in Lebanon is, do you want to bet on Hezbollah? I mean, that is, do, do you think you can use democratic processes to turn a group that has very extreme ideology into responsible democratic politicians over time, if you open up the political system? This is playing with fire. We don't know what the outcome will be in the Lebanon. We don't know what the outcome is in Egypt. I think the problem with the policy is that it's playing with fire. Medium term, any human rights advocates wants to have free elections in Egypt, wants to have free elections in Syria, wants to have free elections in Iran, really free elections in Iran. But this is a massive historical gamble. And I actually think the administration is not ready for the true dimensions of this historical gamble. But I think coming out of September 11th, they, they know that they have to take it. And the, and the Democrats, to get more controversial still, I mean, the one thing about these guys, and I don't like him, is that they have a deeper strategic awareness of the long-term geostrategic stage than the Democratic Party has anywhere you look. And that's a real problem. You want equivalent vision. I mean, the Democrats are the party of Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, they're the party of the people who saw the big geostrategic picture. And in fact, what the Democratic Party is offering the American public, it seems to me, is basically a form of cautious, pragmatic neo-isolationism. And I don't think that's adequate to the challenges out there. This is not said as, in, I'm not in, I'm not, this is not for an interventionist charter. It's just sent that the times require real vision in the Middle East. And, and I don't think that the Democratic side is yet up to the challenge. We have time for just two more questions, right here. Yeah, my name is Valerian, I'm a mid-career student. And my question centers around human rights and the universal jurisdiction, as it has come to be the new frontier in human rights. And I'm asking Professor Ignatiev, where does the universal jurisdiction start? Is it where national sovereignty ends? And going by that, Especially in Africa, we believe this whole human rights argument is some kind of double standards where some activists, Belgian judges, they sit in Brussels mm -hmm. and hand down indictments to African leaders. So I was going to ask you, would you support an indictment for President Bush, Vice President Cheney, mm -hmm. and maybe Donald Rumsfeld for their sure. command responsibility for the torture scandals in sure. Iraq and in Guantanamo Bay? Sure. Well, that's an easy question to answer. Um, you can tell I'm enjoying my last moment of rhetorical freedom, probably the next little while I'm saying what I really think about it. And on universal jurisdiction, to, to say what you really think involves swimming upstream against, I think, a certain kind of political correctness in human rights that's very current. I mean. Every human rights believer believes, and for good reasons, let me make it clear, in the idea of universal jurisdiction. That is to say, there are some crimes so awful, so terrible, that they should be tried in any jurisdiction where the person can be appropriately apprehended. So we have universal jurisdiction for genocide, for crimes against humanity. They can be tried wherever. That's why you get the Belgian case where in a Belgian court in Louvain or Brussels, Africans involved in the horror of Rwanda are put on trial in front of a Belgian jury and, and you know, supervised by a Belgian judge. And I guess if that's the only way you can get justice, okay. But I think there, are, there is a sense, and it's troubling to me as a human rights person, in which justice is local. 
and justice is national, and justice should be done as close to the site of the crime as possible. Most human rights people think it was a wonderful thing that when Pinochet came to London, he was arrested on a Spanish warrant for crimes against Spanish nationals in Chile. I thought it was troubling. I thought that the appropriate place for Pinochet to face the judgment of history and the judgment for his crimes was in the country where they were committed. Because only Chileans, it seems to me, know the full complexity of that story. Now, what the Chileans then say to me is, we couldn't do it. It's too tough for us. All the judges were appointed by Augusto, so we couldn't get justice at all unless we have universal jurisdiction. So that's the tension. I, I think it's unfortunate, for example, that Milosevic is being tried in The Hague. I wish he were being tried in the Balkans, where the crimes were committed, in front of a jury of his peers, that is, the people who suffered and experienced and even in some cases supported him, so that justice is local, so that it's felt. But unless you have some universal jurisdiction, you won't get any justice at all in these things. So it's balancing the universal and the local that we haven't got quite right. And Africans do feel a kind of hypocrisy in the Belgian case. Belgium is deeply responsible for the catastrophe in Rwanda. It's deeply responsible for the catastrophe in the Congo. And then it passes this legislation and prances around saying, we're defenders of universal human rights. Africans don't like that. They have reason not to like that. But unless you have some universal jurisdiction, you won't get any justice at all. That's the problem. And we want to work to a world where justice is done locally. And get to the final question, if there are issues about the criminal responsibility of the President of the United States, the Vice President, the Secretary of Defense, it's for Americans. It's a matter for Americans. American law, for American politics, it seems to me that's where the judgment should be made. Last question. Hi, I'm Dolores Bernard. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is about um, the ethics of exporting human rights values, Western values, um, particularly what your personal view is and what your advice is for those of us who are going into international development and see human rights as a key vehicle to um, lifting up um, economies all around the world. And I know you're gonna be a practitioner as well. So what is your advice, personal advice, and what, what do you hope to follow in terms of the balance between uh, exporting human rights and other people's rights, or other people's uh, views of those rights? Well, the first thing I, I'd say is, I, despite all my bellicose and controversial views, I've always believed that human rights is a language of freedom, and it's not a language of empire. And it's a language of freedom because it's deeply connected to the idea of of individual dignity, by which I mean individual agency. The fact that agents, each individual matters intensely. Each individual has a life that's specially valuable to themselves. And what you want to protect in human rights is that very precious agency, the capacity to shape a life as best you can. And it's obvious any closely examined life shouldn't be pushed around, even with good human rights advice. If you respect agency, you're then committed as a human rights practitioner to a dialogue, to listening, to learning. Um, in most countries, um, uh, they do things very differently. They always have. The knowledges and wisdom of these cultures goes back a very long time before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there's that. And then there's things that are just wrong. They're always wrong. Um, the beating and abuse of women, the torment of children, the blighting of lives. There are some things that just look bad in any language, in any color, in any religion, in any faith. And you work to find the commonalities with their language of outrage their language of grief, their language of, of pain. So it's, the thing about human rights is that it's a language of respect, and respect is very tough. 
It's hard to respect. It's hard to listen. It's hard to learn from people. And the, the final thing is that human rights is not religion. Human rights is not faith. The articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights conflict with each other. All the good things in life cannot be had in a non-contradictory ser series. They conflict with each other. So I try and teach that to believe in human rights is to believe in a practice of respect that is retail, one human being at a time. And it's also a practice of moral skepticism. This is not the business of preaching certainty. This is not the preach business of preaching faith. I mean, in our discussions tonight, I was trying to balance the local and the universal. Um, strategies of intervention versus a whole set of bad instruments that don't work very well. I, I, I guess it comes down to finding a way to reconcile a deep faith in human rights, in human agency, in the practices of human respect, with a deep, absolutely uncompromising commitment to truth. Michael, this has been uh, a real treat both tonight and for your time here. Uh, I have to say I hope that your tribe will prosper, that many in this audience will be inspired to uh, give your wisdom and the deep moral views, the search for truth, but also the very pragmatic uh, step forward. We wish you very well. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you.